learning JavaScript libraries and frameworks can be overwhelming. There are many libraries to choose from and no proper step-by-step -step guides that will teach you how to use these libraries to their fullest potential. That's why in this video, you'll learn the most popular JavaScript library used by hundreds of thousands of developers worldwide, React.js. Hi there. If you want to learn everything from the essential JSX syntax all the way to more advanced React topics like state, hooks, data fetching, and more, you've come to the right place. I'll first give you a high-level overview of what React is and why do we even use it. And then we'll quickly dive into the code, create our first React.js application, learn about JSX, which forms the core React.js syntax, and learn about the best file and folder structure when working with React. Most importantly, in the end, I'll teach you how you can build a React.js application so that you can actively internalize and independently apply everything you've learned in this video. By the end, you'll know precisely what you need to do to become an outstanding React developer capable of building phenomenal applications. With your React skills, you'll also be able to build native mobile applications. Isn't that crazy? React is a front-end JavaScript library for building user interfaces. It was developed by Facebook and is maintained by Facebook and the open source community. React.js is a phenomenal library that is easy to understand, has excellent cross-platform support, has a fantastic community, and is one of the most loved libraries out there. There are also two great React.js competitors, Vue.js and Angular. These libraries and frameworks are mainly used to create fast and efficient single-page applications. Although these are great technologies, taking a quick look at Google Trends, we can clearly see that React.js is still in the lead by far. Now, let's take a look at Filmpire, the first project-based course of the upcoming JSM Pro platform, which is built entirely in React. Here, we can browse around, select a category, select a genre, click on a movie poster to see more details about the movie, and everything happens so smoothly and instantly. And you can also notice that the website never reloads. You can see that on the top bar, which means that we don't request and load multiple HTML pages. Everything works with a single HTML page, and that happens because everything is done using JavaScript and React. While we browse the page, React updates what we see on a document object model or DOM for short. But we don't update the DOM directly, like in HTML. So how does it actually work in React? React uses something called virtual DOM. So what's virtual DOM? A virtual DOM is nothing but a JavaScript object. It's a lightweight representation of the DOM. Updating the virtual DOM is much faster than updating the real DOM. Thus, React only updates the section of the page where the change was made, not the entire page, which is super efficient. Let me explain this in a simpler manner. When something changes in a component, we get a new React element. React will then compare this element and the children of that element with the previous one, and it figures out what has changed. And then it will update a part of the real DOM to keep it in sync with the virtual DOM. So why does React use this so-called virtual DOM? Well, because virtual DOM is way faster than the regular DOM. The main advantage of this is that we don't have to worry about the JavaScript DOM API and React will do all the heavy work for us. Now, you might be wondering, what are the prerequisites to learn such a great JavaScript library? There's only one prerequisite, and that is JavaScript. We cannot talk about React.js without talking about components. React.js is a component-based front-end library, which means that all parts of a web application are divided into small components. A component is a small piece of the user interface. Every React.js application is a tree of components. Components let you split the UI into independent, reusable parts. So when you're building an application with React, 
you'll build independent and reusable components, and then you'll combine them to build a full-fledged web application. Let's take a look at the same example I've showed you earlier to represent what are components. So imagine we're building this website. How would we make it? Firstly, we'll split the user interface into smaller components, like sidebar, search bar, and movies, which includes several single movie components with names and ratings. I can't even tell you how excited I am to share this course with you extremely soon. There are two types of components, functional components and class-based components. Let's see how does a standard class component look like. Firstly, we import React and the structure component from React. If you're a complete beginner, you might wonder where are we importing React from? Why do we even need to import it? We need to import React to be able to use the entirety of its library. Then we use a regular JavaScript class to make a React component that extends the React component already written for us in the library. Then we use the render method that describes what should be displayed and how should the UI look like. If you don't fully understand how to use classes, what are class methods, and what does extends means, don't worry at all. Class-based components are React history. They're not being used at all anymore, and they were entirely replaced by their simpler counterparts, functional components. Now, let's understand how the functional component is written. First, as usual, we import React from React library. Nowadays, you can also skip that line. In the newer versions of React, it's not needed anymore. Then, we can create a function, which can be a normal function, arrow function, named function, whatever you'd prefer. In this example, we're using an arrow function. In the function, we return something that React should display. That's it. That is a React component. You can see how easy it is. You might be thinking, why are we writing HTML when returning something? This tag syntax is neither a string nor HTML. It's called JSX. JSX is used in React to describe what the user interface should look like. JSX may remind you of a template language, but it comes with the full power of JavaScript. JSX produces React elements. It forms the core of React syntax. So to learn it better, let's dive into code and set up our first React.js application. There are two main ways of setting up the React environment. The first one is to manually set it up using Webpack and Babel. And the second one is to use the create react app command. If you're just starting, I would suggest using the second method as it saves you from time consuming setup and configuration. Create react app is a comfortable environment for learning react and it's the best way to start building a new single or multi-page application in React. So what is Create React App? Create React App is a simple tool or a command that generates the required files and folders to start the React application and run it in the browser. It's also officially supported by the React team. To run the Create React App command, you need to have Node.js installed on your PC. Node is a JavaScript runtime that allows you to execute JS code on the server. It's highly probable that you already have it installed, but if you don't, go to nodejs.org and download and install it. After that, we can create an empty folder on our desktop. Let's call it something like my underscore first underscore react underscore app. Then you can open up your code editor of choice. In this case, I'll be using Visual Studio Code, and you can simply drag and drop your folder into it. Now you can head to View and then Terminal. Finally, let's run our first command, which is npx create-react-app and then dot slash to install it in the current directory. Let's press Enter. You might get an additional message here because this is the first time you're using Create React App, but after that, you should be able to see creating a new React app and then your directory. This is going to install primary React packages like React, React DOM, and React scripts. This process usually takes about a minute, 
So I'll pause the video right now and I'll be right back. And there we go. Success, created my first React app. This command just generated all the files and folders needed for your first React application. So let's run it. You can run your application by running npm start and then press enter. This is going to run our application on localhost 3000. And in a few seconds, there it is. Rotating React.js logo with a text that says edit source app.js and save to reload. That way we'll be able to modify our React.js application. But before we do that, we can take a minute to properly explore the file and folder structure of a React.js application. Over here, you can see all the files and folders. Let's check them out. The first one is package.json. Inside of here, you can see all of the dependencies or packages that your application currently has installed. As you can see, the core React.js packages are right here. And then all the other NPM packages that you install later on are going to be added here as well. The code for these packages is going to be added in our huge node modules. This is not the folder that you have to manually explore. It's just there and it serves the code. The SRC or source folder is where all the logic goes. Everything related to our app will be in the source folder. This is where you'll spend most of your time developing React.js applications. If we open up our public folder, you'll notice that there is only one single HTML file. And inside of this HTML file, we have a few meta tags. So I'm going to properly structure them. We also have a few comments that we can delete, a few link tags, some kind of a big comment right here, and that's it. If we remove all of the unnecessary things, we are left off with the simplest possible HTML document that has only a single div with an ID of root. The way React works is that all of our React components are going to get injected inside of this div with an ID of root. To properly explore that, we can go into source and then index.js, the starting point of every React.js application. Inside of here, we have React DOM, which we only call once in our entire React application, no matter how big it is. React DOM is used to render our components and our entire application into the real DOM, more specifically, into a div with an ID of root. This is how we're accessing the basic DOM. We target this div and we populate our entire React application and we inject it right here. That is the base premise of how React.js works. Now, if we go to Explorer, Source, and then App.js, you can see that we have a functional component, something that we've discussed before. Remember what I've said earlier, Functional components are the ones that are primarily used nowadays. No more class-based madness. And this code that you can see right here, that is not HTML. This is JSX. Because you can see, it is in a .js file, not in a .html file. There are a few differences between HTML and JSX, although generally it's incredibly similar. One of these differences is that you can notice class name. Usually in HTML, we would write that as a class, but class is a reserved keyword in JavaScript, so we had to use class name. Since we use JSX in React, the extension of JavaScript, we have to use class name instead of that class attribute, so keep that in mind. All of the similar gotchas of using JSX are also linked in our React.js guide, so make sure to go for it if you want to get more information on the JSX syntax. Inside of curly braces, you can put any valid JavaScript expression. So in here, we're dynamically assigning a logo to this image. For example, we can remove the text inside of this paragraph, open up a pair of curly braces and write two plus two. In HTML, the only thing that you would get would be curly brace two plus two and then curly brace, literally. But now, if we go back to our browser, as you can see, in here, we have four. And that might seem incredibly simple and not meaningful. But think about the power 
that this represents. You can write JavaScript code straight inside of something that looks like plain HTML. That means that you can dynamically render real data inside of your browser. Isn't that cool? So now let's delete this demo example by deleting all of the code inside of it. We can leave the div with the class name of app. And let's also delete this logo because we're not using it anymore. We can also convert this function app into a const app. And that is an arrow function component. Inside of there, let's simply create an h1 that's going to say hello world. Or rather, let's do hello react. And let's save it. And there we go an h1 that says hello react. Now we can dive deeper into the syntax and explore all of the benefits that react.js offers. Let's go ahead and get started with the real thing. Before I start showing you all of the benefits that react offers, let's open up our browser and put it side by side with the editor so that we can see in real time the changes we're making. There we go. I've put the code editor on the left side and our browser on the right side. So now if we type something, for example, hello JSM and save it, you should be able to see the code update in real time. So now let's explore that dynamic or reactive nature of React. We can create different variables right here inside of this functional component. So by saying something like const name is equal to, and let's do something like John, we can use this variable inside of our JSX. So right here, we can open up a pair of curly braces like this and simply reference this variable inside of those braces. If we save that, you can see hello, John. Now, this might seem like magic because this seems just like basic HTML, but we've just injected real JavaScript code straight into it. That is the power of React. We can also do something more powerful, like create different ternary expressions. Let's create a variable is name showing like this. And that's going to be set to true. Right here, what we can do is say hello. And then we're going to check if is name showing is set to true. If that is the case, then we can simply show John. Else we can say, let's do something like someone. Now, if we save that, you can see that we're showing hello, John. But now if we switch this variable to false, is name showing false, then the different part of the ternary expression is going to be ran. And now we can see hello, someone. With this, we've just made the render of our application dynamic. We're going to show a different display based on different dynamic data. You wouldn't be able to do this this easily in just basic HTML and CSS. Of course, Take your time and play with this a bit. You can explore all of the other possibilities that React offers. We're just showing the name here, but you can do any kind of arithmetic, like two plus two is four, that's going to show up. Using these expressions, we can dynamically render larger blocks of code. So if we open up curly braces and then check if name exists, in that case, we want to render this React fragment inside of these parentheses. And a React fragment is just like an empty div. Inside of there, we can put some code. So let's say test for now. And then of course, we need to have a second part of our ternary expression. And inside of there, we're going to say test as well. There we go. We can of course see test. But why do we even need this empty block, so called React fragment? Well, let's say that instead of test at the bottom, we want to show something like an H1. Let's close it properly. And there we're going to simply say test because we don't have access to the name in this block down there. Now let's set the name to be null. So the below expression is going to run. We can see the test. But now what if you want to add a second H2 that's going to simply say there is no name. If we save that, you're going to see a really often appearing error adjectant JSX elements must be wrapped in an enclosing tag. So this is a rule that React has. If you want to render two different elements, one next to another, you need to wrap them in a so-called React fragment. So right here, what we can do 
is just wrap this in a fragment like so, and then we won't have an error anymore. There we go. So below we're saying there is no name, and right here we can say h1, and of course we can render the name inside of the curly braces. Now, if we change this to Jane, save it, you'll be able to see Jane, and otherwise, if there is no name, you'll be able to see this block of code down there. And right now, we're working with just two different tags. You can do the same thing with thousands of lines of code and completely change the user interface when something changes. For example, you can have a variable, is user logged in? And let's say that the user is logged in. In that case, you can show some data and display his user profile. Else, you can simply render a login button. That just shows you that there is a lot of possibilities. Now, let's dive into one of the core React topics, and that is components. We can create many different components and then import them into our larger components. So for example, we can create a new component just above the current one that's going to be called person. Const person is going to be a functional component and it's going to have a return statement. For now, let's simply return an h1 that's going to render, let's do name, and then that's going to be set to John, and then we're going to wrap it in a React fragment so that we can add something below that. We can simply say h2, and then we're gonna do last name is going to be do, as well as the age and let's do something like 30. So this is our person component. And a component is a piece of code that returns or renders some JSX. And in here, we can call our person component by its name. Take a look, it's called person. The only thing you have to do, open up a code brace and start typing person, and then simply close it as a self-closing tag. As soon as you do this, you'll be able to see that all of the code from the above component got imported or injected straight right here inside of the app. Isn't that crazy? One advantage of creating a custom component and then referencing it right here is that we can duplicate this line five times. And with that, we have five person components. Of course, if we wanted to write this manually, we would have to copy all of these three lines. But now you might be wondering, why would we ever do this? This data is the same. How can we change this? Do we have to manually change everything? But then if we change something here, isn't it going to change in all of them? And that is true. But now we came to a really important part of React, and that is props. Props allow you to pass dynamic data through React components. Props are just arguments that you pass into React components they are passed via attributes. They are just a shorter way of saying properties. So in here, if we pass a name is equal to, and we can pass a string of John, we can accept this prop inside of our person component. And how can we do that? Well, every component has a built-in props object. And right here, we can reference that props object by saying props dot and then name. So why did we do name here? Because that's how we call this prop, props dot name. Now, if we save this, you're gonna notice that only the first component has our name and all the other ones are empty. That's because we didn't pass a different name to any of our other components. What of course we can do is pass the last name as well. So let's say last name is equal to do and also let's do age is equal to 25. Now we can repeat the process. Last name is going to be props that last name. Notice how I'm putting this in curly braces. And then in here, that's going to be props that age. And if we save that, you're gonna notice that only our first component has all the data and the other ones are empty. So now let's pass some other data, like name is equal to Jane. You can do it just like this without curly braces if it's just a string. There we go, that works as well. But if you're passing some dynamic expressions, like let's do age is equal to two plus two, in that case, you have to use curly braces. 
but in this case, we were just fine with using normal strings. And as you can see, we can use both double and single quoted strings. It doesn't matter. Now let's remove some of our people. Let's copy our John person. And let's just simply rename it to something like Mary Doe, and that's going to be 24. And there we go. Now we have just two different people and every single person is completely different when it comes to data. Now, of course, imagine if each one of these people is going to be an entire user profile. It would have much more than just three tags. It would have an image, all different kinds of properties, hobbies, about sections, many more other components and class names. So if that were the case, and if we didn't use custom components, then we would have to copy and paste all of the JSX every single time. But if we put all of that code into a component, we can simply call it every time in a single line and pass new dynamic properties based on a different person. Of course, if you have a lot of properties, feel free to space them out in a new line, like so. That way, it's going to be just a bit easier to read. There we go. Now that we've learned about props, let's learn about React state. We can remove all of these people right here and also remove our custom component. State in React is a plain JavaScript object used by React to represent a piece of information about the component's current situation. It is completely managed by the component itself. So how can we actually create state in React? First, we have to import in curly braces, a so-called use state hook from React. This is going to allow us to use the state, of course. And before we actually call this use state, let me show you a scenario where you're really going to notice the purpose of state. Let's create a counter. A counter is going to have two buttons. This one, that's simply going to say minus. It's going to have some kind of an H1 in the middle that's going to show the count, which is going to start at zero. And then we're going to have one more button, which is going to have a plus icon, and it's going to increment that count. We can see that minus is on the top and plus is on the bottom. Right now, if we click this, nothing is going to happen. So we have to use state. Right here at the top of our component, we can say const, and then use a concept of array destructuring. That is how state works. So we create a pair of square brackets. We say equal to, and then call the use state as a function. Whenever you call something as a function and it starts with use, in React, we call that a hook. Now, the first part in the square brackets pair is going to be the name of that state. So let's call it counter. The second part is going to be a setter function and we can call it set counter. A good rule of thumb is that you call the second variable the same as you call the first one, but add the set in front because it is a setter function for the first variable. Now, inside of the use state, you provide the initial value, which is going to be zero. Now you can use this counter just as a normal JavaScript variable. Right here, let's reference it, counter. And as you can see, nothing changed. That's because the initial state is still zero. So now we're going to learn about events. An event is an action that can be triggered as a result of the user action or some kind of a system generated event. For example, a mouse click or a button press is an event. And here is how we can handle events in React. On this button, you can add an on click property written like this. There, we're going to have a callback function. A callback function is the one that simply doesn't have a name. It's here and it's just waiting for some kind of a command. Right here, we can write an inline code by simply saying alert clicked. If we save this, you can see that if we click on a minus button, we're going to get an alert that says clicked. That means that we read the event properly. But now on the click, we don't simply want to alert something we want to change the state. For that, we're going to use the setter function, set counter. What we can do is we can set it to something like minus five or any other value. 
And if we now click this, you can see it gets reset dynamically, the code changes. Now, how can we lower the count by one each time that we press a button? Well, inside of the set counter, we're going to create a callback function. And right here, we have access to something known as a prev count. This is just a parameter of the set state. You can call it however you want, but a good practice is to call it prev as in previous and then the name of your state. And what we can do is simply call the prev count and decrement it by one. Now, if we save this and reload the page, as you can see, we can keep clicking the button and the count changes. We can duplicate this line, paste it below our counter. And in here, the only thing we have to change is to add a plus right here, as well as right here. Now we can increment our counter as well. And I know this is a small application, but it's dynamic. You're clicking on it and you're changing the state and therefore re-rendering the view. Again, a really important thing is that all of this is happening without a website reload. If you keep tracking this, keep looking at this reload button. When I reload, it's going to change. But now if I keep clicking, it remains the same, which means that the website is changing without a reload. And you might think, of course, this is a simple application. Nothing has to reload here. And you would be right if you think that. But imagine all of the complex websites that have tons of functionality, a lot of moving pieces and everything else. The situation is going to be the same. If you're using React, then you can update everything on the page without needing a page reload. That is amazing. When we started talking about state, we immediately mentioned hooks because we cannot use the state without using this React hook. And there are many other hooks. As you can see, we have the three basic hooks as well as some of the additional hooks. By the way, I'm looking at this in the official React documentation. I would strongly encourage you to go through their docs, at least through the main concepts from the hello world, all the way to thinking in React. Their documentation is phenomenal. Definitely make sure to go through it as the practice after watching this video. So with that said, let me also show you the second most used React hook, which is use effect. We can simply import it at the top as we imported the first one, use effect, and it's going to get called a bit differently. We type use effect right here, call it as a function, and then it accepts one more function as the first parameter. Again, a callback function. You can see that we're using a lot of ES6 syntax array destructuring, import syntax, arrow functions, and more. So I would strongly encourage you to get comfortable with JavaScript ES6 plus before you dive into React. Use effect allows us to do something on some kind of an effect, or let's say on some kind of an event. So this code right here is going to get run as soon as the page loads. So let's say reload. There we go. I saved it and I get an alert that says reload. If I reload the page one more time, it's going to happen again, because this code happens as soon as this component renders. So using this use effect, and knowing that this is going to happen at the start, how would you change our counter, our state to be 100 as soon as the page loads? If you wanted to do something like this, counter is equal to 100. That's going to cause a major issue. We cannot see an error yet, but that's because we're breaking the most important rule of React. And that is never modify state manually, never mutate the state. Counter is not just a normal variable. It is a part of the React state and React state can only be changed using its own setter function. So this here is strictly forbidden. And as you can see, the app doesn't work. So let's simply call a set counter. And this is how you would set the counter to 100. As you can see, it is 100 initially, and now we can modify it. But something happens. We cannot really modify it. It seems that this use effect is happening too often. And as soon as we click it, it brings it back to 100. So there is the second parameter 
to the use effect, which is called a dependency array. If we now save this, we've just left our dependency array to be empty. So now if we modify this, we can clearly do that. The value only gets set at the start. That is because when the dependency array is empty, the code inside of here, more specifically inside of this function, is going to only happen at the initial load of the component. But if we add some kind of a variable here, like a counter, then this code is going to update every time that the variable inside of this array changes. We would got into an infinite loop if I tried running this. That is because if I initially set the counter to something and then I keep changing it, it's going to continuously run because this function is changing the counter and then the counter recalls it. That is not a good practice. So what we can do is simply alert something whenever the counter changes. Let's say you've changed the counter to, and then let's simply say counter. There we go. Now, if we save this, you've changed the counter to 100. Let's reload the page. You change the counter to zero. You change the counter to one, two, and so on. This is not a good user experience, definitely. But the only thing I wanted to show you here is that you can call some code whenever something happens in your React application by simply providing that variable here. And whenever that variable changes, then you can call the code inside of the use effect. With that, we've learned the three most important things that React offers, and that is components, state, and props. Of course, alongside that, we also learned hooks, more specifically the use state and the use effect hook. And we also talked about events, more specifically the on click event. I'm pretty sure that you're ready to build your real React.js project right now. So what we can do is open up our file tree by clicking here, and we can completely delete the source code because we don't need many of these files right here. So let's go ahead and right click, click delete, press right click right here and create a new folder called src. Now let's test your knowledge. What does every source component needs to have? What is one file that absolutely needs to be there? That is going to be index.js. Inside of there, we import react from react as well as import react dom from react dom. Then we can say import app and that app is coming from that slash app. Of course, we haven't yet created this. So let's go ahead and create a new file, which is going to be called app.js. Inside of there, we can import react from react. We can create our app, which is the main functional component that looks like this. Our app is going to have a return statement. And then inside of that return, for now, we can simply return an H1 that's going to say app. Let's add a semicolon here. And of course, let's do export default app. We have to export every single one of our components so that we can then call it from somewhere else. In this case, we're importing it inside of our index.js file. And inside of our index.js, as we learned before, we have to do react dom dot render. And then we have to pass in the component we want to render, which is in this case, the app component. And then we have to trigger document dot get element by ID, and then pass a string of root. This is going to trigger our div with an ID of root, and it's going to inject our entire React application right inside of it. And finally, if you reload the page, you should be able to see app right here. Sometimes React messes up a bit when you delete the entire source folder. So you might need to go to view and then terminal and then press control C and then Y like this. And then just restart application by running the npm start command. Whenever you want to restart it or close it, control C and then Y. There we go. With that said, now we have an empty working environment 
just the source with the app and index.js. And we are ready to create our application. Believe it or not, in this video, you're going to build a simplified version of the Filmpire project. So this is the Filmpire project. It has nice animations, a central card, all of the different categories, movie details information, animations, and even voice artificial intelligence. Of course, dark mode is there as well. But we're going to build this, which is a simplified version of the Filmpire application called Movieland. There, you get access to all of the movies that you search for. In here, we have Batman. Let's try to go with something like Shrek. <laughs> that should be good. There we go. Let's try to go with something like Superman as well. And just click search. And you immediately get all of the latest Superman movies and you can scroll through them. Of course, the application is fully mobile responsive. So if you right click, click inspect, and then click this little icon right here, that's going to toggle the device toolbar and you can see that your application is fully mobile responsive. So what do you say? Let's go ahead and get started with implementing everything you've learned so far. Managing state, using different components, props, and so much more. Let's pull our browser on the side and let's get started by going into our app.js. I'm going to keep this website open just for reference. When it comes to Filmpire, we can close that tab. By the way, if you're interested in learning React to extremely advanced levels while building this great application, definitely make sure to click the link in the description, join our newsletter to be the first one to get into the course. With that said, we can now close this and start transforming our app into movie land. Alongside using state, hooks, and so much more, we're going to also use an external API, an application programming interface that is going to give us access to data about these movies. So that might be a good starting point. You can head to omdbapi.com forward slash API key. The link is going to be down in the description. Then you can choose your account type as free and enter your email. I'm going to do JavaScript mastery, enter my email right here, and you can type use building a movie app and click submit. In a few seconds, you're going to receive a verification link to activate your key to your email address. Once you get the email, you'll have to activate your key by clicking right here. You're going to see a message that says your key is now activated. And then you can go back to your email and copy your API key and paste it as a comment right here because we're definitely going to use it later on. Now we can close this, close this as well, and go back to our application. So let's explore the ways in which we can call this API to get all the data about movies. We're going to create a static variable called API underscore URL. And that's going to be a string that's equal to HTTP colon forward slash forward slash www.omdbapi.com question mark API key is equal to and then you can simply copy your key and paste it here. That's going to be our API URL. Now we can use that from inside of our component to gather the data. More specifically, we want to fetch the data from this API as soon as our component loads. Do you know which hook can we use for that? It's going to be the use effect hook. So right here, we can import the use effect hook from React. Let's call it, as we learned, use effect accepts a callback function and an empty dependency array as the second one if we only want to call it at the start. Now inside of there, we're going to call a function that's going to fetch our movies. So just at the top of our use effect, let's create a new function. Const search movies is equal to an async arrow function. Async stands for asynchronous data, which means that it takes some time to fetch these movies. 
and the search movies is going to accept a search title that we want to search by, like Superman or any other title. There, we can say const response is equal to await fetch. And then in here, we can use a template string. You can do that by using the backticks. On my keyboard, it is a key left to the one key. There, we can dynamically specify the API URL. So API underscore URL, and then say and s is equal to. And then one more time in here, we want to specify the title. So this is going to call our API. Now, once we get the response, we have to get the data from it by saying const data is equal to await response dot JSON. Now, inside of this data object, we should have the data about the movies. So let's simply consa log it for now. Consa log data. We can open up our console, go to inspect and console. Right here, nothing is happening because as you can see, we're never calling our search movies. So what we can do is simply call it inside of our use effect. And let's also provide it a title, which is going to be a string of your favorite movie. Feel free to put any title in there. In this case, I'm going to go with Spider-Man and save it. As soon as we save the file, we're going to notice that we get back the search, the response and total results. We only need the movies array, so we can console log data dot search. And now we get only an array with 10 Superman movies. That's great. That means that the API fully works. But now we need to be able to render that data and show it inside of our application. To make your life easier, I'm going to provide you with the entire CSS file for this entire application. Today's focus is to learn React, and you're going to do that with this project, but you don't have to manually write every CSS line. So what you can do is create a new file called app dot CSS. And then in the link below this video, there's going to be a GitHub gist containing the code for the entire app.css as well as app.js. You can simply copy the app.css and paste it right here. This is going to contain the styling for our project. There's also going to be a search.svg. So let's create a search.svg component and let's simply paste what you copied from the GitHub gist down below. This is just going to be a search icon. Now that we have the styles, we of course have to import them as well as import the search icon. We can do that by saying import in a string dot slash app dot CSS. As soon as we do that, you're going to notice that the styles are immediately applied. And while we're here, let's also import the search icon from dot slash search dot SVG. Great. We're going to use this later on. Now we are ready to start creating the JSX of our application. So let's start with a div. We're going to wrap everything inside of a div. And that div is going to have a class name equal to app. Inside of there, we're going to have an H1 element. That's going to be the name of our application. Let's call it movie land. And it gets positioned nicely in the middle. This is like writing HTML, but you're going to notice the power of react as soon as we start making it dynamic. Below that, we can create a div that's going to have a class name. Keep in mind, this is class name, not just class as it is in HTML. And that's going to be equal to search inside of this div, we're going to have an input field. An input is a self closing tag that has to have a few properties. First of all, it has to have a placeholder, which is going to be equal to search for movies. If we save that, you're going to notice this nice input appear right here. An input in React needs to have another two things, which are crucial. The first thing is going to be value. For now, let's set it as a static string of Superman. As soon as we save that, you're going to notice that this input immediately has the value of Superman. But now if you try typing something, you won't be able to. 
because the value is statically set. So how do we change it? For that, we have to have an on change, which accepts a callback function that looks like this. For now, let's leave it empty. We're just going to make it static for now. And then later on, once we implement the state, we're going to make this actually changeable. And that's going to recall our API. Below our input, we're going to have a self-closing image tag. And the source is going to be search icon. Of course, every image tag also needs to have an alternative tag, which is useful for screen readers. So we can say search and save it. And there we go. Now we have this magnifying glass icon. Our magnifying glass icon is also going to serve a purpose of a button. So we can add an on click property right here and also add an empty callback function because later on, we're going to be calling our above API straight from here. But for now, we're just building the JSX. So we don't care about that for now. Now we can go below this search div and create a new div. This div is going to have a class name equal to container. So what we can do right now to test this out is go to inspect, go to console, array, let's take one of these Spider-Man movies. And let's copy the entire object by right clicking and clicking copy object, we can go to the top and say const movie one is equal to and then we can paste that. Right here, we're going to get the data for that specific movie. We're going to use this as static data just to render out something so that we know what JSX are we writing. So inside of this container, what we can do is create a div that's going to have a class name equal to movie. Inside of there, we're going to also render a div. And inside of that div, we're going to render a paragraph. There, we want to show the year of the movie. So what we can do is say movie one dot year. Now, if we save that, you can notice we got 2012 right here. Below this div, we're going to create one more div. And this is going to be the div that's going to contain our image. Our image is going to have the SRC or source property equal to movie one dot poster, not poser, that's going to be poster and an alternative tag, which is going to be equal to movie one dot. And that's going to be title. Now let's save this. And it looks like we cannot see the image for this movie, which is great, because it allows us to add an extra check to make sure that there is an image. So what we can do is say, if poster is not equal to n a, this is how this API declares movies that have no image, then we can render a movie that poster, right? But if there is no image, then we can render https colon forward slash forward slash via dot placeholder dot com forward slash 400. This is a placeholder image. And we get a nice error from react saying that poster is not defined. So this is going to be movie one dot poster. And there we go, we have a 400 by 400 placeholder image, we're going to provide this placeholder image if the API doesn't provide us with a real movie image. With that said, the most important thing that we can add below this div is going to be another div that's going to have a span element inside of it. And there we can render movie one dot type. If we save that, you're going to notice that the type of this movie is a movie, it can also be a TV show. Below that span, we can render our last element, which is going to be an h three, that's simply going to render the movie one dot title with a capital T. If we save that, we're going to notice amazing Spider Man syndrome movie 2012. Now we have the look of our single movie. But this is not that good, because it's just one. And more importantly, the data for that movie is static. So how can we fetch the data for all the movies, and then display them here? 
The first step in doing that would be extracting the code for this movie into its own custom component. And the reason we're doing that is because if you think about it, we're going to have many of these cards. They're going to be repeated quite often. So instead of doing something like this, where we would have to have hundreds of lines to show just a few movies, what we can do is just create a custom component and that way we'll be able to do it almost in a single line. So let's copy this entire div with a class name of movie. Then go to our file explorer and create a new file inside of the source folder called movie card dot jsx. Now you might be wondering, why did I add a dot jsx extension to this file? In react, whenever you create a new react component, jsx extension is preferable. It adds this react logo on the left side. And that's basically it. There isn't any difference between a dot js file and a dot jsx file. I usually add a dot jsx file for any component that I create in react. And it's going to be the same. It's going to be import react from react. Then we're going to create a component const movie card is equal to a functional component. Notice how the file name and the component name are the same. This is not a necessity, but it's definitely a good practice. Then we can render the return right here. And then inside of the return, we can paste what we copied. We can also hold control and alt and then press arrow down a few times. And then we can indent this properly. There we go. Now we can export default movie card. And we can also notice that right now we don't have access to this movie one dot something. So we're going to potentially pass that over through props. You already know the drill. We're getting access to the props right here. But just so that we don't have to repeat ourselves props dot something every time, what we can do is destructure the props. Use object destructuring. So that means simply put a pair of curly braces here and then get something that you passed inside of those props. So now we have our movie component, the same as we had our person component before, but it's in a separate file. So inside of the app.js, we can now import at the top, import movie card from dot slash movie card. And now, as we learned, instead of this entire div, we can simply call a movie card and call it as a self closing component. But of course, we also have to pass in a prop called movie one is equal to movie one. And if we do that and go back to our application, you can see that we have the same thing we've had before, just a single movie card. But what we've done right now is going to make our life so much easier later on once we want to map over all of our movies. The first step in doing that is getting our movies from right here, from our console log, all the way to here, where we can actually map over them. So what we can do is create a new state. We can say const movies and set movies is equal to that's going to be equal to the call of the use state hook. Of course, we have to import it at the top. That's going to be use state next to use effect. And we can set the default value of our movies, which is going to be an empty array. This is going to give us access to the set movies setter function. And instead of console logging it, now we can pass the data.search into our set movies. Of course, that gives us access to our movies. So now we can dynamically pass movies and then zero into our movie one. And this is going to allow us to populate the movies. So what we can do right now is at the bottom right here, open a dynamic block of code using parentheses and check if movies question mark dot length is greater than zero. If that is the case, then 
we want to render our movie card. So let's take this movie card and put it right here. Let's indent this properly. And then else, if that is not the case, so if there are no movies, then we want to render something else. And that something is going to be a div. So we can say div right here, give it a class name equal to empty, and then create an h2 element inside of there, that's going to say no movies found. And we can save that. And nothing's changed. That's because we actually have movies in our array. We would only see this if the movie array was empty. So considering we do have the movies, why are we still seeing this one static card? Let's fix that immediately. What we can do is instead of showing this one single card, we can open a dynamic block of code and then map over movies by saying movies that map, and then we can map over them. We're usually mapping over arrays, which are plural. And then inside of there, we're going to get a singular movie for the each iteration of the map. So what do we want to render for each iteration of the map? That is going to be a movie card component. If we save that, we're going to get an error because we're not passing the movie prop. So let's pass a movie prop equal to movie. Now this is going to dynamically change. But of course, we have to go right here. And we have to change this into movie. Of course, we have to change it in every single other place as well. The movie one was just a placeholder. There we go, we also have to change it here as well. And with that, we're dynamically looping over our movies array, which is fetched from an API, we're taking each individual movie, and we're dynamically passing it as a prop to our movie card. And that's going to result in the render of all of our movies. Some of these movies don't have an image, but don't worry about that at all. That is API's fault. Now we can kind of tidy this up a bit by putting this right here, putting this here as well. We can fix the indentation. If we go ahead and move everything one step to the left. There we go. And this is already looking much better. Our next step is making the search functionality work. And for that, we're going to need another state. So this might be also something new to you, you can have multiple states, and even multiple use effect hooks per one component, there is no limit. So right here, let's say const search term, as well as the set search term is equal to you already know the drill, use state. And then we're going to pass in an empty string, because our search term at the start is going to be empty. What we can do then is inside of our input, dynamically change our search term. So our value is not going to be static anymore, we're going to use curly braces, and we're going to change that to search term. So now it's dynamic. As you can see, it's empty at the start. So we can only see a placeholder. To be able to change it, we need to do a similar thing we've done before with the click event when we changed out counter. So we need to set the search term. And then we call it and pass in the e dot target dot value. And that e we're talking about is coming from the callback function right here. That is the event. Right here, not sure why I have set service that was supposed to be set search term. That's much better. And now we can actually type into here. So if I type Batman, you will be able to do that. The question is, how can we use that state to dynamically re render our array of movies? For that, we're going to use this image, more specifically, the on click listener, we can recall our search movies function and pass in a new title. We can do that by calling search movies. And then we can pass what not a specific title, which is static, but rather we can pass in the search 
term, which is the dynamic state. So now every time that we type something in here and click the button, the state is going to dynamically change. And that is looking great. You can see we can hover over it to see the year, also more details. And we have all of the movies right here. It looks great on mobile devices and it looks great on desktop devices as well. This might be the first React application you've done. Congratulations. I hope that the ease of development of this little app showed you that React is definitely something you want to learn and be an advanced developer in. The ease of development and the ability to scale your applications are just amazing when working with React and also the developer workflow is quite nice. You can code HTML here and you can combine JavaScript immediately with